in depth, anything like that, anything we do at Duke, I'd be happy to, to connect with anybody and, you know, obviously, you know, answer questions at the end of this. But um, if we're ready to just get started, just jump into it. Sounds good. All right, let me share my screen right here. So first things first, we're going to talk some fundamental work today, um, things we do here. I'm in a little bit of a unique position because I've, I've gotten to learn. I've been here a long enough time where I've learned from some great receiver coaches, guys like Scotty Montgomery, um, you know, Jared Parker, Trooper Taylor, guys that know that. And I've really been able to kind of craft my own philosophy from everything that they do well. Um, but first things first, talking releases, the, the unique thing about releasing – um, and, and really playing receivers, it's such a, it's such a matchup based position. So for the most part, you're going to be going against one guy for a whole drive or really a whole game. And I really believe you can't give wideouts one formulaic release. You can't do like, this is how we're releasing. This is how we're doing. Because by the end of your first drive, your release game is getting stale. So I'm really a, a huge proponent in giving guys freedom to be creative in the release game. And, and, and letting them work and figure out what works for them. Um, the, the way I look at it is we're, we're at a natural advantage because we're facing the finish line. Like if it's a hundred meter dash, we're facing the finish line and the DB is facing us. So we're, we're already at a natural advantage. Anything we do that takes a lot of time or causes us to play high at the line is playing into the defense's hand. So while I'm a huge proponent of creativity, we got to be able to stay on time and understand that there's a pass rush and, and we've got to get to where we need to get to. But um, other than your basic speed release, here are a couple releases that we've had some success with in changing it up. The first thing is called a fast dive, right? So when we're talking fast dive, we identify corners in a number of different ways. This is a great release, a great change up release for a guy who's a bigger, longer guy, you know, not inclined to move off the line of scrimmage as readily or move laterally. Uh, you're really going to have to threaten them. So guys are going to align either inside leverage, outside leverage, head up, all that. You know, if a guy's inside leverage, we're going to try to make him overprotect inside and then release outside. So we got to really threaten him. If he's a guy, a bigger, taller, you know, longer guy who's not inclined to move, we're going to have to really threaten him. So what we're going to do is we're calling it a fast dive. We're going to dive outside, head, eyes, violently shoulders, you know, everything we can to make this guy overprotect inside and then release out. Really want to get this guy to move off the spot. And then the key thing here is we got to be gaining ground the whole time. We don't want to be making this move behind the line of scrimmage. So we want to attack him with what we call halves, half steps. And we're going to get to that uh, uh, more. We're going to talk about what I mean by that. But, uh, again, attacking a guy with halves, here's it on air. And then we're going to get to it against uh, uh, us as coaches. So we wear these crayons, these padded crayons, and in these drills, we really, we really lay on these guys and more, more physical with them than, than they'd ever get in a game. But if you see right here, both guys dive fast. You got to be sudden, sudden to make this guy really respect the move that's going, you know, toward his leverage to get this guy off the spot. Fast dive. And then as much as possible, as much as possible, I want guys to only clear an arm, like when he's, you know, in their hand-to-hand -hand combat, Clear with the near arm. If you can keep that outside arm free to pump and run, that's best case scenario. Now, the, the primary objective is getting off the line. So there's times you're going to have to double arm swipe and all that. But if you can keep one arm free to run, you're better off. But again, whatever it takes is, is what's going to happen. Here at Duke, we're really lucky. We have had a lot of pros uh, wide out at quarterback. So Daniel Jones came this offseason. This is Sterling Shepard. He brought some of his NFL guys. So this is Sterling Shepard working a fast dive right here with me. And you can see he does a great job of only using that, that near arm to, to clear, keeping that other arm free. He's extremely sudden. Obviously, he's a, he's a high-level professional athlete. Any type of move he gives is extremely sudden. You have to respect it. But, um, but this works great for our guys, too. I'm going to use a lot of one-on-one -on -one clips because it's a really great opportunity for us to get a, a solo cam on the wideout, which isn't something that, that we see all the time. But watch number 11 here, our guy, as he's gaining ground the whole time. He's coming off with halves, half steps, attacking him, and then he gets the fast dive inside. Again, head, eyes, shoulders, everything you can do to sell in a quick inside move to get a guy to move off the spot. And here's another example. Sorry, let me get back to that. So this is a dig, right? So he's going to release, he's going to release inside, but he's going to dive outside. All the other ones we've seen so far have been diving inside, releasing out. 
So on a dig, we're trying to get inside, dive outside, get the guy to move off the spot. Great job at the break point. All right, now on the left right here, our left receiver, he's going to hit the guy with a fast dive. We've got inside leverage, as you can see. Fast dive, good job hiding his shoulder, getting on top, you know, making a play. And again, this is a change up off the speed release. You know, this isn't something that, that we've got to do every single time. You've got to give these guys freedom. Third and eight against Carolina at the top of the screen, heavy inside leverage. You can see a fast dive, and he's going to do a great job of hiding his shoulder as well, reducing his surface for contact. But fast dive inside. You can see we're on the bottom of the numbers. This guy's on the numbers. He's inside. We're making him jump inside even more, overprotecting it, and then an unbelievable ball from the quarterback. Big third down conversion. Um, but again, you got to be able to give guys freedom to, to go in their bag and know when they're going to have to win. I mean, there's times as a wide out when you're going to get a play called and you know that you're going to have to be special and you just can't let guys get into a, a formulaic approach where they're like, well, this is how I release. You got to let guys, you know, win. You got to teach them how to win. Um, okay. Slow dive is, is kind of the, the counter off this. So slow dive. Now we got a guy that's really going to mirror our movements, a smaller guy, you know, some people call it motor, motor technique, what have you but we're going to be able to take this guy for a walk a little bit. And, and the more veteran your guys get at wide out, you can teach them to split adjust based off the release they want to take. So you can have a guy line up wider if he's like, Hey, well, I was going to slow dive and really move him off the spot and get back to my original alignment. So that's kind of the game within the game. And as you guys get more experience, they'll start to understand and you can give them as, as a coach a little bit more freedom um, in their alignment, knowing that they're going to try to make things look like other things. But a slow dive is the same thing, but now we're really going to move the guy. We're going to really move him. At the top of the release, so to speak, or at the break point of the release, we're still going to be sudden and try to sell it with a, a head, eyes, shoulders, everything like that. But we're going to really try to move the guy initially off the spot, develop much slower, right? This is great for a skater, a smaller guy, like I said, or a squatter who you've already fast dived on a bunch and, and, and kind of got him, you know, loosened up by the second half, maybe second, third drive of the game. So here you go. You can see still trying to keep that outside arm free if we can, or that, that non, the, the, the arm to opposite the defender, but move the guy off the spot a little bit more than we did on the fast dive, develop a little bit slower. And then when you're doing these drills with them, you, it's important. You got to shoot your arms, try to get in their chest. It's so, it's so important. You're teaching these guys how to defeat an arm before they, they let it get to their chest. Right? So here's an example. This is a great release for the low red. Um, but a great example of a slow dive, moving them off the spot. So we're aligning on the bottom of the numbers here, and we're really taking this guy all the way to the top before we're releasing on a slow dive. And again, even though it has the word slow in it, we still have to be on time. And we have to have great understanding of the route, the, play, the concept, everything, just so we know when to use what as, as, a, as a receiver. But here we go. The ball's inside on the left here. So we're going to slow dive inside and then go out on the fade again, low red zone. Great job. All right. This is, I really kind of hate showing this clip because um, it ends up being a sack on the play, but this is a, a hellacious slow dive at the bottom of the screen right here by our guy, um, you know, knew it was going to be a skater. This is, you know, definitely not at the beginning of the game. He, he, he worked them a couple times, but slow dive at the bottom of the screen, really moving the guy off the spot and really sudden, I mean, just kills him. And unfortunately, end up being a sack. But here we go again against Notre Dame. Bottom of the screen again. Slow dive. Gaining ground the whole time. I'm not talking big foot over foot steps. I mean, these are half steps you're gaining ground. It's just you can't let this happen behind the line of scrimmage. We can't be stagnant while we're making these moves. All right, the next phase of the release circuit, I guess you call it, is the reality drill. We call it the reality drill because this is the reality that we face at wideout today. I mean, you know, we, we play in the ACC. Uh, against great corners, uh, well-coached corners, very physical. They're not um, – it's just a new era where we're not getting a PI call at, like we used to, and, and we just stop talking about it altogether. We just say there's no point in discussing it. Um, we're, we're not going to talk about pass interference. We're just going to give you the tools to fight back. So these two coaches here, we're, they're the same defender, just cloned twice. So it's the same guy. But we're going to try to shoot an arm with the first coach and not let him – you know, hopefully the receiver's – not going to let him get in his chest. Um, and then the second guy, you're really trying to be physical and make this guy clear your arms off. And when we talk about clearing an arm, you know, we're really specific with these guys. What we're saying is 
We're trying to club down a low arm bar and wipe up on a high arm bar. And our aiming point is from the wrist to the elbow. So we're trying to land this from the wrist to the elbow and we gotta be tight circles when we're clearing. I mean, tight to your body, violent circles. When you get way out um, of your framework, you're not as strong and you really wanna ball up your fists and, and, and make them remember when, when you get to clear an arm, you, you want them to be hesitant later in the game to, to, to put that arm back on. But young wideouts all the time, they think if you just clear once, it's enough. The fact is, as many times as the DB replaces that arm, you have to clear. You have to clear. If you have to clear all the way down the field, then you have to clear all the way down the field. But this isn't just one time. And if you think about, I mean, the defender's arm on you, that's their sense of security. When you break that arm off, it's panic mode. So as many times as he's replacing it, you got to clear that arm off. So again, really run with this guy as the back coach and, and try to clear that arm. And if you can, try to give him different things, a high arm bar, a low arm bar, get him, get him wiping and clubbing down, all that. But um, really trying to make him earn it in the first 10 yards. And we have a rule, any vertical stem, any route with a vertical stem, we want to be on top at 10 yards. And, and that's not an ask. That, that's, a, that's really, a, we're, we're really demanding about that. Um, so really whatever it takes. And we're going to talk more about that in a little bit. Um, as an aside, you're going to get yourself in pretty good shape as, a bat, as the back coach in this. You're going to do some running. So a little bit of a conditioner. All right, this, guy, this clip right here, this is a great one to coach off of. 82 is not a pro. Uh, he didn't even have pro aspirations. He, he's working on Wall Street right now. A great kid, extremely coachable, a technician. And he's going against our best corner right here. And, I mean, he's not as talented as him, but – it was just so important to him. And when you can really make it important and emphasize how much it means to get on top at 10 yards, you'll see what it happens. I mean, th this guy, he's going to hit him with a dive release right here to start it out. Great dive. And then he's doing everything he can. He's clearing, clearing, clearing as much as he's got to clear in order to get on top. I mean, just a relentless effort from a guy who's just earning everything. And that's what you, I mean, we tell him it's your mom eating or his mom eating. You just got to find a way. And, you know, we do different things to fix it. Your release game's not always going to work. There's going to be times you have to fix it, which we can talk about. But, again, just clearing, 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 punch. And we're going to talk about that punch in a little bit. But that's so crucial. All right? On the right right here, you're going to see an example of clearing. Not getting on top, unfortunately. But clear. As many times as he replaces that arm, you're going to have to clear. And then here's a game example at the bottom, running a post. And again, clearing all the way down the field if you've got him. But that sense of security, when you break that arm off, it's panic mode for the DB. They're not going to be able to be in control anymore. All right, this is the next phase of this where we call this the matrix. And again, we're cloning the same defender a million times just to save legs. So we're going to come off the ball, and then we're going to try to wipe at each one, wipe and club at each guy. Now, this is early when we were first really getting into this. So we were prescribing it, hey, give them low arm bars, give them high arm bars. Now we've progressed where we can mix it up on them, um, which is good to just mix it up on them and change it. But the thing about this is we're, we're, we're wiping all the way through, and then the last guy, we're working a punch off at the, at the end. And now this is something that we've been doing for the past couple of years, and um, we've really got it down to a science. If you do it in the first 10 yards, it's not going to be an offensive PI call. So in the first 10 yards, we're saying you got to punch them. And it's not like an extra, you've got to punch them. If you care about getting on top and separating, you're going to punch off. And what we're saying is it's a same foot, same arm action. I mean, to get the most power, you want to step and punch with the same side um, at the same time. And we're aiming for the near shoulder tip. So clear, punch. And you're really trying to separate right there. And that, that, that's going to prevent this guy from holding on to you. Because I know we, we, have, we used to have issues Guys getting held, you know, we can't separate. Well, if we're clearing and then punching, and we're really telling these guys, quarter turn and punch the guy. You can see it right here. I mean, that, that's, that's a huge part of the deal. So you can see right here, this is a great example. Speed release, clear, clear, punch. As many times as you've got to clear, and then in 10 yards, if you, it happens later, you're, you're subject to a, a call. But in 10 yards, we're saying you got to punch. You better punch. If you care about getting on top, you're punching. Here on the right, the receiver, this is a great example. Speed release outside, you know, nothing fancy about it, but clears and then leans right into him and punches off. That's, that's textbook. And, you know, we hadn't had one called, thankfully, and, and I don't think we will because it's happening so early. I mean, you can see where it happens. We're getting that punch done at about eight yards, seven, eight yards right there. 
and it creates so much separation. I mean, there's nothing that, that, that can be done about it. Here's a good, let's see if we can get a good look at it. Yeah, quarter turn and punch. Here's a game example. This is actually fourth down, fourth and like two or three. And you can see at the bottom right here, uh, right, right, you know, at the bottom of the screen, punch. Um, this, this has been a, a real game changer for us as we got to it. At the top right here, you can see how you can see the effect on the defender when we hit the punch off. This was reviewed and ruled a touchdown, thankfully. All right, now the next step of the matrix drill is we're saying we got to reset at each guy. And, you know, we call it reset, second level release, you know, half steps. It's all, you know, the words, the same thing. So when we're talking second level release game, specifically for the slot, um, for your slot receiver, really any vertical stemming route is going to have a, a second level release at slot. Um, you know, anytime you incorporate a, a defender at the second level, we're saying you cannot take on contact on one foot. Now, what that means is if you're running foot over foot, normal running, and you try to take on contact from a zone dropping linebacker, for instance, he's going to catch you when you got one foot on the ground and one foot in the air, and you're going to, you know, you're going to get knocked on your ass. And the only way to combat this is at the second level, when you anticipate contact, you've got to be able to get your cleats in the ground. And I'm not saying come to balance. It's definitely not that at all. But what I want is our weight on the inside part of our feet with knees inside. And it's a second level release. It's just like a crossover in basketball and an old school, you know, Allen Iverson crossover. But we're trying to pop halves at each guy. Each time that we're going to get contact, we're popping halves and then we're going to punch off the last guy. So this is just a slight variation modify of the last, modification of the last drill to help the slots. But again, pop each guy working a second level release while we're clearing. And when we're working the second level release, we're trying to ball up our fists and keep these arms close by our waist right here so we can club down and wipe up all at the same time. So we're ready to go. You got to activate your arms while you're popping halves. And our slots really start to get savvy at this. And it just becomes without even thinking. We're going to see see some clips. But here's really what we're looking for on a slot fade right here on a second level release, pop and have steps, what, what I'm talking about at the next level. So he comes off the ball. And then right when we feel contact, gonna, you know, we're at the junction point, so to speak, at the second level, there's half steps right here. That's a crossover in basketball. And it's not always going to be contact, but you're going to be ready for it no matter what. So here at number two to the field, we're going to see a good example of the second level release, half steps right there. And then at the single side receiver right here, this is a bad example of a punch, right? So we're running, we're running, and he's going to punch off way late, way past 10 yards. If he's going to punch, it's going to have to happen in 10 yards. This one, you're really opening up yourself to get a call right here. Just for some reference on that, all right? So again, at the slot right here, we're talking about half steps, second level release right there. Bop, bop. That's really what it is. I mean, it's just bop, bop with your feet. You gotta have, especially at slot, I, I'm a huge fan of having guys that have a basketball background as a guard or someone who's really, you know, has experience dribbling a basketball because this really resonates with them. And the slot is obviously where, you, where you're gonna have the most opportunities at second level release. It's important for your outside guys too, but, but it's definitely a unique deal at the slot. Same play, different receiver at the slot, but exactly the same thing. It's happening much closer to the line now, but pop and have second level releasing. But yeah, both those guys that just did it have very credible basketball backgrounds, which I think is, is important. Um, again, it's the same concept now in a game with another third different player at the, at the slot working a second level release. And then you can see he's got that arm activated right as he's doing it, ready to clear which is so important, and then a big-time play with the ball in the air. All right, again, this is Sterling Shepard. Uh, love showing his film just because he's such a special athlete. You can really see what, what it looks like ideally. But this is Shep doing second-level releases on each of these bags. And you can see, I mean, it looks like, even look, look at his hands, it looks like he's dribbling in a basketball. I mean, but this is elite second-level release pop and has. We'll see another clip of it right here. But th this is really... When you're cooking at slot, this is what it should look like. 
All right, now here's a great clip of a second level release, really getting the, the hands involved, coming off vertical on this defender, pop halves, and then you can see our, our guy in white, his left arm work to clear that low arm bar. And then a great job tracking it in. Uh, in a game down here uh, to the bottom of the screen, on screen just outside the hash in the weak slot right here, this is the best second level release we've had in a game maybe I've ever seen. I mean, just all he is is crossing the guy up and then an unbelievable throw to save his life from the safety coming over the top. All right, perimeter blocking, um, you know, not the most exciting thing, but, but really when it comes down to it, I, I really believe at wide out the three most important things are beating press, which we just talked about, um, making contested catches, and then perimeter blocking. Those are really the three things it comes down to for me. And, and I really want my, my players at wide out to be evaluated the same way. I mean, th those, you know, when we're putting drills together, those are the three most important things um, when time is involved that, that we've got to get done. So it's beating press, contested catches and perimeter blocking. So perimeter blocking, you know, what we talk about, it, it's the greatest challenge for us is that we're, we need to be effective in so much space. We're going against these defenders in a unique amount of space, you know, compared to everybody else in the block game. And the biggest term we use is Gretzky. And what that means is we like Wayne Gretzky is, you know, he, he gave you, you know, listen to anything he ever said, he talks about his success was based on his ability to go where the puck was going, not where it was. So we want to say, go to where the defender is going. Don't go to where the defender is now. So we're saying Gretzky all the time. That, that's a huge buzzword for us in the wideout room um, is we got to take a Gretzky angle. And, and that, that really the most important thing is we've got to gain leverage first. Gain leverage first. The later it happened, the later in the play, it's much easier to go vertically than side to side. So when we're gaining leverage, we want to take shuffle steps. Like we're playing basketball defense. We don't want to ever cross over. Just like an offensive line, you know, you're in a bad power position and you're not in a place to take on contact. So we want to shuffle, gain leverage right here. Like our guys are doing to offset the board and then they're going to gain leverage on the boards. There's one here. Uh oh, it's a bad deal. See if we can get it back up, but we're going to gain leverage on the boards like I'm talking about, and then we're going to get our feet hot. So while we're gaining leverage, once we get to the imaginary board on the field, you know, you're going to have to imagine the board out there. Once we get to the imaginary board, you got to change your feet. So our feet got to get hot, like machine gun feet while we're going. And um, just so we can have as many cleats in the ground as possible you know, when, when contact comes and then the closer we get, we're going step punch drive. So step gain ground with it and then punch, fit your hands inside and then drive. We want to get our hips, roll our hips forward as close as we can. Anybody that, that knows, you know, that's been around wide at all knows that in the block game, DBs love to sling you, but when you can cut out the space and really roll your hips forward, you're going to be able to cut the space and, and eliminate their ability to do that. But you can see these guys change their feet once they get on the board. And obviously in the game, you're going to have to imagine the board, but you got to go pop, 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 machine gun feet. Your feet change. Your feet change. When we're cutting the distance in half between the defender, you got to change your feet. Step, punch, drive. Right? So here's a great perimeter blocking drill we do. It's like a half line perimeter blocking type situation. Uh, good job really by both guys, but specifically the outside guy changing his feet once he gets close to the defender, imagines the board. Now I got to fit with inside hands. He doesn't do a great job with his inside hands. You know, a lot of times we're going to have to refit, break those arms and refit inside. And then I'd love to see him roll his hips more, but still get a job done. Um, another clip at it, same, same exact play. Just fit those hands inside and run your feet, right? Now here, now we're going the other way, the other side of the half line. At slot, the guy right on the hash, this is why, this is why you don't cross over. So he's gaining leverage first. He's Gretzkying, right? If he goes to where the defender is now, the defender's going to overrun him. He's got a Gretzky, take a great Gretzky angle to where he's going to be. And then he didn't cross over. He's shuffling. So now he's in a position to still take on contact, even though he never really got vertical. That's a, like, really, I mean, just a great job in a, in a tough situation. And, I, you know, this is a tough drill for a lot of reasons because, you know, there's no threat of a downfield pass. So, you know, this is really the hardest situation. The, the defense is triggering. They know what's coming. But if you're going to hit a Nolan Ryan fastball, you can probably hit anybody's fastball. Uh, great job by the outside guy running his feet, too.
All right, step to your punch. So a lot of young players at wideout, they, they have a hard time with this. And they, um, you know, they, they take a drop step before they step to gain ground with their punch, which we're trying to eliminate. So this is a great drill. You just start them at the top. They've already gone game leverage, gone through the board. Now it's just the top. Just step, punch, and roll your hips forward to take around and take out as much space as possible. Just trying to isolate this one, um, this one fundamental on it. Young players, like I said, want to take a drop step. So it's really important to pay attention to the wideouts feet and just make sure they're just stepping positive with no drop step. Sometimes, like on this next clip, you know, I, you know, got to hold the guy's leg, make sure he doesn't drop step it. Just step, gain ground, and then we want to see him roll his hips way better than that. But fit and refit your classic offensive line drill, a uh, pretty tough drill to do, a conditioner as well. But start with hands and then have the next guy break those arms and refit them with inside hands and keep going back and forth. Uh, really love this drill. Your classic O-line fit and refit. And now here we go at slot. This is a great example of watching our guy change his feet once he gets to the board. The guy on the hash to the field. Defender's playing like he's got five fouls, really backing up off us. But you can see he changes his feet, gets his feet hot, outside hands, and then tries to refit him and get inside. That, that's really a great job working that fundamental. Down at the bottom, at the bottom of the screen right here, number five, really fighting his ass off, inside hands, running his feet. I mean, that's a great clip of the step punch drive, really. And then the other thing that really should be mentioned is when it comes to perimeter blocking, I mean, I've heard it say it's 90% effort, and I think there's some truth to that, but th this is really uh, unbelievable effort. I mean, you got to want to. you got to want to do it. But this is a great effort. Obviously, uh, you know, RPO throw and then the outside wideout really just dominating the guy. And, and you got to want it and you got to be excited about it. Um, so last thing I talked about was, was making contestants and, you know, just catching the ball in general. I'm not going to, you know, go through a, a whole bunch of things on the jugs machine here. But what I do think is important is as the wideout coach, you're always going to be fighting to get more catches and more balls at practice. And, you know, we did a study um, – a couple years ago, and we found if, if a wideout's catching 20 balls at practice, they're pretty busy. That's a pretty busy practice. So that's not enough. We want our guys to get 100 a day. So we let guys out early in meetings, like five, 10 minutes early, get on the jugs machine. Guys are staying after to get their 100. You, you really got to make it important. But the thing about jugs machines that, that I really believe in strongly is that you can't ever just do it stationary. I see too many guys just catch a jugs machine, just staring right down the barrel at it without moving their feet you got to be able to get active feet and, and make it, I want to make the jugs as hard as possible. I want to make it like a game or even harder. So everything's going to be on the move and everything is going to be with these big bags, trying to make it late vision, um, you know, just giving some distraction, you know, we'll put on the crayon sometimes and beat them up a little bit as they're coming through, but you got to make it late vision and just make it as hard as possible and really train these guys, whether it's curls, digs, slants, and you know, anything you can do on these, but just making it hard. And again, you're going to have to, you know, as a wideout, fight the battle to get as many throws as you can at practice. And again, this is a good drill. You're not killing anybody's legs, but you're still moving and you're not just staring down. Because, I mean, how many catches in a game do you, do you have without moving your feet and just stationary? It's, it's very few. All right, so at the weak slot right here, this is just a good example off of what the jugs work will help you with. Um, at the weak slot at the top of the screen, you know, our guy's coming off. And just like the uh, ultimate contested, distracted, blow up catch. But, um, you know, we feel good about this because of how much we're working on the jugs. And then, you know, we got a contested catch drill that I'm going to show you, uh, I think, up next. Again, again, another good drill right here to save a guy's legs. At wide out, you're always going to be running more than any other group. Um, so, so whatever you can do in Indy to help, a guy, help guys out, you know, late in practice, late in the year. But again, just post up with the guy. You got one coach just really, or another player even, just really lay on him and, and make it as physical as you can. And then just get kind of a jump on, you know, have guys get in there and then high point it and rip it away. Go up and get it and rip it away. And then the thing that shouldn't be, um, you know, just glossed over, which is really important, is anytime you're in a contested catch world, there's going to be times where if you – rip it away from the guy and you bring it, rip it to a tuck, the DBs, especially guys we play are so well coached and trained that they're going to try to anticipate you tucking it and pry it out. So if it's going to be a, a catch and fall down situation or in the end zone, a, a catch and score situation, sometimes when you tuck that ball, 
you're giving the defender an extra chance to get it out. So just keeping it away from the guy when the play is going to end is important. Right here is a great clip. Obviously unbelievable by our quarterback and keeping this thing alive. But then the wide out catches it, high points, and then he just keeps it away from the guy the whole time, which is like, you know, if he, if you can see, if he tucks it right here, the defender is going to be able to pry it out. So anytime it's a catch and score, or the play is going to be over a catch and da- go down, you know, keeping it away from the guy as much as you can, you kind of have to fight the urge to tuck it sometimes. The golden rule, all right, so this is the golden rule of leverage and route stemming, which is really one of the things I believe in the most. This is more important than maybe anything you know, that, that, that we could be talking about is how to set up routes with your stem. And this sounds really wordy when you just look at it, but if the defender's where you want to go, bring them to you. If the defender's where you want them to be, leave them there. So we're going to break it down piece by piece, but this is really the, the best way to describe it, our golden rule of leverage, bring them to you. So the defender's where you want to go, you got to bring them to you. So we're running a slot fade. That's a huge concept for us, as you guys have seen on this a number of times. That's an outbreaking route, and we've got an outside leverage defender. He's where we want to go, so we got to bring him to, to us. So what we're going to do is if we just stem this outside, if we go outside right here, he's going to weave out, and he's going to just take away our space. And by the time we're breaking, we're already on the sideline and we're out of room. Too many guys do that. So what we want to do is we want to go dead vertical or seam slightly inside to try to get this guy to change his leverage. And these guys are coached, hey, you know, what you align to protect, you protect, all that. But if you can really make them believe they got to get off their spot and, and co- expect an in-breaking route or a dig or something right here, that they're going to give up their leverage. It, we've seen it happen too much. So he's where we want to go. We got to bring him to us. We go with a heavy inside seam right here. But you can see he's outside leverage initially. And by the time we break, I mean, he's inside leverage at this point. So now what we've done is we've bought way more room for the quarterback and we've changed this guy leverage. So if he's where we want to go, we got to bring him to us. He's outside leverage. We want to go there. Got to bring him to us. Same thing. Outside leverage again, slightly outside on a slot fade. And again, we got to bring him to us. All right? Head up. Now he's head up. That's what we want. And we've bought more room for the, th- the throw and the quarterback. And then you can see how well trained these guys are right now, where you see that right arm on 84. He's trying to club down. I mean, the guy's not even grabbing him, but just in case, he just like anytime we're popping halves, anytime we're half stepping at a second level release, automatically get our arms activated. Love to see it. All right, again, at, at the top of the screen right here, just outside the hash, we've got an outside leverage defender on the slot fade. Trying to, we got to bring him to us. He's where we want to go. Bring him to us. In a game, outside leverage at the slot just outside the hash at the bottom. This is a true freshman, first year player for us, really starting to understand these things, starting to play the game within the game, trying to set things up. But you can see outside leverage, bring them to us. We gotta bring them to us. Ends up being a huge explosive touchdown against Miami. Um, All right, now again, it's not just that route. I know I focus on the slot fade a lot, but we've got a, a bang eight right here at our slot at the bottom. Um, you know, a glance route, whatever you want to call it. Um, we had an inside leverage guy, right? So if we seam this thing inside, this guy's going to weave inside even more and take it away. He's going to squeeze us down. So we, we really want to go dead vertical and have this guy weave out to us and open it up. If you can threaten him enough, but he's clearly inside leverage here. And then we come off the ball vertical, and now this guy weaves out to us. Now we've opened it up. And now we got a chance, which is really all you can ask. All right, and this is a classic example too. A lot of young players have problem with this. So number one to the boundary right here at the bottom of the screen, we got a dig versus off inside leverage, a tough look for a dig. Um, So many guys seem this dig so far inside that this guy weaves in with us at, at the defender, and now we're breaking it on the hash, and we really want to be catching this thing on the hash. So just like how we said in the other thing, you just got to apply the same rules, but we want to go dead vertical and have this guy, he's going to weave to us. He'll weave to us. It's happened too many times. I mean, I, I know he will. So we come off vertical, he weaves to us, and now we've opened it up without closing the whole window out, and we have a huge catch and run explosive play, if that makes sense. Um, okay, on a post, often inside leverage, the bottom, often inside versus a post. But again, just go dead vertical. 
this guy's going to weave to us. If we spend too much time seeming inside, he's going to close it down for us. We're never going to get there. But a great job understanding the golden rule of leverage and, and scoring. Um, so at the, here on the right, we, we have this empty set where we got a weak slot right here uh, outside the tackle. And, you know, we're, we're running basically what comes out to be a slant. It's, it's a little bit more complicated of an option route than that. But if we come off and seem at this guy inside, he's going to push farther in toward the quarterback in the center. We're going to run out of room. But if, especially a linebacker, you come off vertical and get this guy to weave to you in a tight window situation like this, he's going to open it up for us. And, again, if, again, just coming off vertical, you can see – our guy doesn't go too much inside those, those letters on Brooks, but just second level release, halves getting his arms activated, but opening the window with the golden rule of leverage most of all. And then a great job after the catch. Same type of deal right here, but th this really applies, you know, in this package that we have out of empty so much. But this guy, the linebacker on the left right here, he just jumps out just enough but anything is better than him going in and, and closing that window out. So attacking this guy vertically rather than going at him is so important to open this up and get this guy to come to us. All right, the opposite of this is leave him there. So that was, you know, if he's where you want to go, bring him to you. Now we're trying to leave him there. So if we, so again, slot fade, starting with this route, we've got inside leverage. That's good. We're good. We're going out. He's inside. We got to leave him there. But understanding the last, the last topic really is that if we go vertical, he's going to weave to us, which is a disaster. We can't have it. So what we want to do is leave him in there, seem at his leverage, make this guy weave in farther, and now we're good. But if we just go vertical, he's going to come out to us, and, and that, that's going to ruin the whole deal. So we're leaving him there because he's where we want him to be. And you guys can see what happens. And I know this gets a little bit repetitive, but this is like, you know, this is as important of understanding leverage at the wide out position, you know, as, as anything. So again, the ball's to the right, right here. Um, we got inside leverage. We're leaving him there. See how much we get this guy a whole yard off his original alignment. And that matters, especially in the low red. All right, in a game, inside leverage at the slot, right on the hash. We're leaving them in there. We're running a slot fade. We're leaving them there. Unbelievable throw. But a great job of understanding leverage. Same thing right here against Miami. And this is the thing, understanding the game within the game. You know, we got multiple hits on this one concept, changing our stem based off of their leverage. And again, you got to do enough in your game plan to, to have real – real threats off of these stems, the different stems. But, um, you know, once you get your guys to understand leverage and how to use it to their advantage is, is huge. So this is Alabama. This is Calvin Ridley at number three to the field right here. You can see the effect. So he's running what ends up being basically a sale route against an inside leverage, often inside leverage defender. But, um, you know, the way he – so he's where he wants him to be, so we're going to leave him in there, you know, push him farther in. Push his leverage farther in. And this is unbelievable at the break point. I mean, this is as sudden as anybody I've ever seen. But the leverage, I mean, anybody could do this with the understanding of leverage. Okay, now here is our, so the way we couple it with the last thing at the weak slot in our empty package and this. So now, we, you know, in addition to that slant route, we basically give them a stick route as well. So just like we talked about, now the last one, we wanted to come off vertical and have this guy weave to us so we could break across his face. Well, now we're running a stick route and we're going to go outside. If we come off vertical, this guy's going to weave to us. That's no good. I mean, it's so important for tight ends to understand this as well. But if we can attack this guy inside, we're going to push him farther inside and give ourselves more room. So it's, it's the pairing of these two stems and these two routes. So you really get a, a, a pretty good package to play off each other. But you see the effect? He, he expects that we're running the, the previous route, the, the inbreaker. He's trying to overprotect it. But now we're going out, and we left him in there. It's outstanding. And then the next one, this is a great clip to watch because even, like, the worst-case scenario, so watch this one. The, the linebacker, he doesn't even move, right? We go inside, you know, it's just a little bit. It's not way inside, but we're going inside to attack him, and he really doesn't even move, which is the worst-case scenario. But even this is better 
than him weaving to us. So even if you just attack him and he stays there, that's still a win. Also, there's a lot of value in putting a really good athlete there where he's going to get covered by linebackers. Should definitely uh, mention that. All right, attacking the guy inside at the weak slot right here. Gets him to take a couple steps inside, just like how we saw it in practice, and it's money. All right, so here's a great example I love of the, just the whole golden rule concept, right? We're running a post right here at the slot at the top of the screen against the inside leverage defender, right? So he's where we want to go. We got to bring him to us. Dead vertical, the guy gives up his leverage. All good, you know, touchdown, good guys. Now it's the same exact play, exact same concept against the outside leverage defender right here with this slot running a post again. Outside leverage, if we go dead vertical, this guy's going to weave to us. We got to leave him there. He's where we want him to be. Leave him there. If he's where you want to go, bring him to you. If he's where you want him to be, leave him there. Step outside, you know, a touchdown against really cover one, which is a tough deal. Um, top of the route. So what we talk about is get out in two. So when I take get out in two, um, you know, it's really – uh, plant, gather, turn progression at the top of the route where it's kind of a three-step. You plant, and then it's two more steps. And the best guys can really get out in two steps. Um, it's hard for a lot of guys, but you really train them enough. Getting out in two is the goal. Um, and this is a great, you know, anytime you work top of the route, you, you really can incorporate a lot of other techniques. So we're going to do our pop halves technique right here. You know, we got these three cones set up. We're going to second level release on the first cone. But if you watch the guy at the bottom right here, I mean, this is really sudden. And we're trying to, you know, drop our chest to our knee. The guy at the top, you know, getting low, drop our chest to our knee, and then be as explosive as we can coming out of this thing. Um, but we're going to see some pretty interesting examples right here. So here we got our pro guys again, Sterling Shepard at the top, and Evan Ingram, a tight end actually to the bottom. Really impressive. Um, but when you guys see, they, they get to the top. And I love this drill because it's two drastic cuts. I mean, it's two, like you're making one, and it's a really hard angle. I mean, this is, a, this is a hard situation. You can get good at this. You're going to get really good at, at any curl, really. You're going to ever need to run. But when they're coming to the top, this step, so we're looking at just Shep up top, that inside step right there, when he right gets around that cone, that's really how you can tell an explosive athlete from a regular guy. Explosive athletes are gaining ground on that inside foot right there, on that step when they come out of it. Right. Most people just pick that step foot up and put it down. And it's, it's a hard, I mean, you don't even think about it. It's hard, but the real explosive athletes, and you can see Ingram even gaining some ground on it. He starts with the foot on one side of the line ends with on the other. That's really hard to do. That's an explosive athlete that's going to gain ground on that. Very rare. So, you know, whether, you know, a camp drill, anything like that, evaluating guys, you know, if you can see someone gaining ground, you got an explosive guy. I mean, that's hard, but you can see them both on that one. Do it. All right, in a game right here at the bottom, you know, some, just a good example of, of getting out into playing, gather, turn at the top at the bottom of the screen right here. I mean, there's a million different cone drills you can set up, but anything you can do to make it hard and have guys, you know, really work to get out of cuts, you know, re really drill those guys at the top right here. We run this route a lot. This is, you know, as hard of an angle as a stem curl. You're going right back down your stem. Talking about the wide out at the top of the screen right here really drastic angle. You can see him get low, really get out. I mean, the only chance you got to be an explosive getting out of this thing is if you're dropping your chest to your knee and then a big time run and catch for a touchdown. Clear before you break something that doesn't get coached a lot, which really, um, you know, should people should pay a little bit more attention to it. In my opinion, um, everybody runs a curl, you know, everybody's teaching. You got to throw the guy by, you got to throw him by, you know, if you go outside on a curl, you're, you're throwing the guy through. And um, what, what a lot of, t what happens to us at least in this league is we got guys holding on to us so much. If you try to throw him by and he's holding on to you and you're throwing him by, he's just coming for the ride. I mean, he's stuck to you. He's not going anywhere. You're going to have to be, you know, incredible to be able to, you're so strong to get this guy off you while he's holding on to you. So what we're trying to get our guys to do is we try to get them to break the arm and then throw by. So this is, again, trying to save legs, just the top of the route. But you can see we're getting guys break the arm, clear, and then. You, we say you got to clear before you break. You got to clear before you break. So break that arm and then try to throw him by. But if you throw him by and you hadn't done the dirty work of clearing that arm, he's coming with you. 
you know, we, we've had some, some real success with this, um, you know, helping get better at the top, especially we, I mean, we see so much press man. We're in this position a lot. Our defense is a, a press man team. So we, we, you know, every day, which I'm thankful for. It gives us a real chance to get better at it. Top of the screen, again, clear and then very violent at the top with his throw by. But if he's got that arm and he's still holding you, you know, he's coming for the ride. Right here uh, at the bottom, I guess the single side guy, well, it's two by two. I mean, the, you know, the bottom of the screen, really violent physical, throwing the guy through. I mean, you can see if he doesn't get his arm on you, he don't have a chance to come with you. Run after the catch. This is really fun. I mean, this is something we have, we have a lot of fun with. It's something we weren't good enough at. We, we were really struggled at run after the catch uh, a few years ago. We just weren't getting what we needed out of it. Um, so we just let, try to get creative with it, you know, listen to other people, listen to the players, different things, and, and find different ways to get better. But um, this is a great scenario. So we take these big yoga balls, and we just throw it at the guys. So this, uh, I mean, uh, we, we do this in the spring, you know, summer, uh, you know, whatever, whatever you get, the guys can do this themselves but try to work a late vision deal with this pop-up, incorporate as in many fundamentals as you can. But we throw these yoga balls at them and, and let them dodge. And it's, it's a good, like, public shaming thing if someone gets hit by it. I mean, it's some good pressure that comes with it. It's a little embarrassing. But j just working on these guys, breaking tackles and expecting, you know, contact right after they catch the ball, getting their eyes around. Um, but, yeah, th this is – the guys really like this a lot. Um, and then we can see some examples in the game where, where it's really paid off at the slot right here. You can see catches it on that bang eight, and then he's got the defender, the safety, the middle field guy coming right for him. And, and you know, that's, that was big time growth for us to get to that point and, and not just make that a catch and tackle. Um, here we go at the, at the top of the screen at the slot. It is really, this is the same thing as the drill. Catching a bubble and then making that guy miss. That guy's just a yoga ball to us. And then another great drill for it is we, we got this from the New England Patriots. Um, they do something similar, but, but this is a really good drill. It's um, working a contested catch right here. So we got, you know, a, a defender and a, and a receiver and then another defender here. So we're working a contested catch. And then we got an alley tackling drill. And, you know, we don't always go live on it. We just kind of thud them up sometimes. But um, this is great. You get a contested catch work. And then also we've done it too, where the defender trails the guy and tries to punch the ball out from the back, which is good. Um, you know, we need that too. But yeah, you got one-on-one, -on -one, one move in the alley against these guys. After you work the contested catch. Our guys like this. Anyway, as many things you can do competition against the defense, I think is, is good. And, and the guys really like competing. But um, this is my contact information. Um, I'll be happy to, you know, I'm going to look at the questions in, in a second and see what we've got. But, um, you know, I'm happy to talk wide out play, happy to talk football, anybody that wants to reach out. Um, but, yeah, I mean, I hope this was beneficial for you guys. You know, I, I love talking about this stuff. Um, let's see. Let me get this right. All right, let's see some, some questions. All right. Do you have a grading tool to measure player performance in practice and games? If yes, what does it use as a grading criteria? So, to me, when I'm looking at practice film, I mean, obviously, you know, alignment, assignment, effort, that, I mean, that's huge. Did you get your job done? But, but what I love is, um, you know, what's so important to us is we, we got to get on top at 10. And we made that so important. We really started to see the benefits of it. Got to get on top at 10 yards on all vertical stems. I mean, you just, we just made that a mandate. And we, you know, when we were first really getting serious about that, I would grade them on. I mean, I would have, I would put a report every day. Here was your percentage on, on top. And I also did contested catches. Here's your contested catch percentage. I mean, what you emphasize is going to be what's important to these kids. I mean, they're going to want to please you as, as your coach. So, you know, if you make something important, they should be working to, to, to get it. Um, when do you shoot the hands and when do you try to keep them on the defender? Or do you just punch and withdraw? I think the second you get a good inside fit. So this guy asking and blocking, when do you shoot the hands and when do you try to keep them on the defender? I, I think the second you get a good inside fit, you just drive. You step and drive. At that point, you don't need to refit unless this guy's knocking your hands and you end up outside. That's when you refit. Will this be posted somewhere? Yeah, I'll post it. Um, hopefully, I get an MP4 of this or some sort of video file and I'll post it. But if you just you know, email me. I'll give you whatever you want. Um, I, I mean, you know, it's hard for me to see these live. It's hard for me to know. Are you telling him to attach his inside shoulder? I don't know exactly. 
Um, do you mix up these drills day to day or better question? What are your everyday drills? So, you know, like everybody limited time. Um, I think the, the, like I said, press release, making contestants and perimeter blocking. Those are the most, those are the three things that, you know, you got to budget your time, the run after catch stuff. I mean, that's something fun. That's off season stuff. Um, you know, now and then in the season, top of the route stuff. I mean, you're working that a lot, whether it's RVA, you know, team, anything like that, but I, I want to get as much press release work. I want to get as much perimeter blocking work and I want to get as much 50, 50 ball and just ball catching work as I can. That, that, those are the, when I'm thinking about individual drills and you've got a limited time, that, that's really what I'm focused on. Do you have, I don't, I don't remember, but do you have a form that captures, I don't remember what that's referring to. Oh, what do you use for ball security? So that last drill we looked at is a great ball security drill. Um, but, you know, just emphasizing that they got to get a ball tucked unless it's that one situation that we talked about earlier. But, you know, just kept getting it tucked, you know, not fumbling it. I mean, you know, we, we, we do, we, this spring before it got shut down, we were doing a good job of getting every position of ball security circuit every day, which, you know, as an offensive guy, there's nothing more important than, than maintaining possession and scoring, really scoring. And if you don't have the ball, you can't score. So, um, you know, I, I think all your guys need to do ball security work. Yeah, so my contact info, again, um, my email is eli.kimac at duke.edu. That's E-L-I dot K-E-I-M-A-C-H at duke.edu. My number is 508-468-6678. Um, anybody that wants to reach out, I'm always, I'm always down to talk. When I worry about – okay, so when you talk about getting on top, you worry about losing time with the quarterback. The quarterback is throwing to your original landmark. If you, le if you weave in, you have to weave back out to make the catch. Yeah, um, so the timing is everything, right? So on a slow dive, you can't do that in like a quick game. I mean, you got to understand that, you know, RPO is hard to slow dive. I mean, you got to really understand we're getting like a max pro. We're in, you know, a position where we're going to be throwing, you know, a goal line fade, something like that. Or, you know, we just know that, that based on the concept, I can win backside. Um, so, yeah, the timing is important. You know, that, that's why it's important that the wideouts understand the play and the whole concept and what's going on. But, um, yeah, that, I mean, that's huge. Do you have a progression for teaching popping halves at full speed? How do you get them there? Or a cadence for the footwork? No, they're like, again, you're going to have to start slow with it and just, you know, on cones, just the feet is just that you want to, like, go from feet, like, bop, 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 to bop, bop. That's really what it is, just bop, bop. So, setting up cones and say, all right, we're going to pop halves on this. This guy's a defender. And then you just run, you slow up to him, pop up, work it. All right. Then, you know, it's a pop-up, then it's a guy. And then, you know, it's in a route and you, you just kind of just, you, you got to have to develop it over, over a long time to say that guys just get it after one or two, two times of talking about it or showing it. It's not the case. That's why, like, you know, guys with basketball backgrounds, I really take too, because they, they understand this. They understand this. Perfect. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I don't know. Does anybody have anything else? I mean, if that if that's it, it's, it's been a pleasure. Like I said, anybody can reach out to me whenever they want. Um, I'm happy to, to, to talk football, talk wideout play as much as possible or just anything. Um, but, but yeah, again, it, it's been a pleasure and I appreciate it a lot.